Good morning. First off, let me say happy Mother's Day to all of you who are moms and uh, it is a precious ministry, uh, a very sacred calling and you are to be congratulated for being chosen to be a mom. So, uh, my mother is still living, and she is 93 years old and sharp as a tack. Uh, for all the moms that have gone to glory, we remember them on this day. And don't forget to call your mother, which I need to remember also. Uh, having said that, um, I remember a story. This fellow passes away and goes up to um, heaven and St. Peter says, Well, and if you'll remember, um, Jesus said in my father's house, there are many rooms. He said, Oh, really? I thought we would all be in a big room. No, no. Uh, what religion were you? And he said, Well, I never really settled on one. He said, well, then let me show you some rooms where you can spend eternity. And they went to the first room and opened up the door. And there inside was a lot of gospel, old good time hymn singing. And then there was a lot of preaching. And then they played Just As I Am, and a bunch of people came forward. And St. Peter said, that's the Baptist room. He said, well, let me see what else you have available. And he, St. Peter took him down the hall, opened up the next door, and uh, there were people singing with a rock and roll band, and then some were speaking in tongues, and then some fell down slain in the spirit. And St. Peter said, that's the charismatic heaven's room. So, now let me look at something else. And he went down and they opened the door. And then everyone was saying prayers in unison. And there was this smell in the air of incense. And then every, every, every once in a while, they'd ring a bell. And they called it the bells and smells of the Anglican Church. And that was their room. So, well, do you have any other? So, well, I have one more. But when we get there, you have to be very, very quiet. And so they opened the door, and the man looked. And he said, St. Peter, why do I have to be quiet? He said, oh, they're the Presbyterians. They think they're elect and the only ones here. When I was growing up, I remember when I was about eight years old, I was visiting one of my friends and... The parent pointed to a dashboard of a car. And the parent said, that's a Catholic car. I said, well, how do you know a Catholic drives that car? Do you see that little statue of Jesus on the dashboard? And that's Catholic. And they're idol worshipers. Well, I carried that with me for a while, but I am so happy that we've come a long way in 60 years that Roman Catholicism and Protestantism can talk about where we are alike instead of our differences. We have Roman Catholic professors at our seminaries. We've had Roman Catholic lay theologian 
speak to our Sunday schools. The lectionary, you may wonder what all this has to do with the lectionary text. Um, the lectionary is from the 14th chapter of St. John. And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And when we think about it, we may react to one, in a way, uh, to a kind of hard saying. Doesn't this promote some kind of exclusivity and bigotry against other religions? Aren't all religions, don't they all have the same validity? It just doesn't seem fair to pick one out over another one. The World Christian Encyclopedia says that, we read that, there are over 10,000 different religions. 150 of those religions have more than 1 million adherents. How can we be so sure that we are the right one? How can we say that they're wrong? Aren't all religions equally valid? Well, let me be bold enough to say that there are some relig religions that are not true they're false. They're harmful to humanity. And they are deplorable. Well, I guess that makes me a bigot. Or close-minded. Let me show you why I say that. We go back thousands of years ago, and there was a religion called Baal worship. The Israelites found that Baal worship was the predominant religion in the land flowing with milk and honey. The requirement for Baal worship was your first born child would be given to the priest who would then place that child in the hands of the Baal altar and light a fire under those hands and burn the child to death. And then you would be guaranteed prosperity. south of us, in the lands of the Aztecs, we remember from our history that the Aztec priest would insist on human sacrifice by ripping out the heart while it was still beating before the crowds of people. They did this in order to appease the gods. Now, some may be too young to remember something in my lifetime. A group of religious folks, they started off here in the United States. It was an offshoot kind of supposedly Christianity. And they wanted to change the world, and so they bought land in northern Guyana. Their leader was the Reverend Jim Jones. 
And on a certain day, Jim Jones had the entire people drink cyanide laced Kool-Aid. 913 of them died. That was the people's temple. Some religions are just false. They are destructive. And they are deplorable. And it is untenable to say that all religions are equally valid. But, we might ask, don't basically the main religions teach the same thing, really? Well, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, teach monotheism, which is belief in one God. But some parts of Hinduism say there are many gods, hundreds of gods and goddesses. Now, we can't say that they're teaching the same thing, because monotheism is one god, and polytheism, many gods, are not one in the same. So, you might ask, so Christianity, is it the only truth? We only find truth in Christianity and all, there is all falsehood in other main religions? No. There's a great amount of wisdom we can learn from listening to other religious perspectives. We will find that we have areas of agreement and areas of disagreement, but we treat them as Christians with respect. And I will have to say, even in Christianity, I have radical disagreements with some of the more popular pop Christianity that I might call it. It's a matter of fact, the Christ or God that they present, I no longer recognize. Who are they talking about, I say to myself? Why? What they present almost seems anti-Christos or anti-Christ to those of us who profess a more orthodox kind of Christianity. I talk frequently about prosperity gospel because I see it as a blight upon Christianity. That if we are following God, we will be totally prosperous. And that is the end to the means. And I wonder how they are doing while we are in the midst of this COVID-19 crisis. For certainly many of them are not prospering. As a matter of fact, the prosperity gospel is one of the oldest religions in the world. It's not called gospel, it's called fertility cult. You make the sacrifice, or you say a certain belief, and you will prosper financially. And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I want you to consider the religious context. Look at the history of the Jewish people. 
They believed that they were the ones, the chosen ones. The ones that God truly loved. God didn't love anybody else but those chosen people. And so they could go into a land and wipe out, completely obliterate entire cultures because those cultures did not really matter. God didn't mind it because God loved them. In the time of Jesus' day, the primary belief was that if you were following the law of God and righteous, you also would prosper financially. You would ward off sickness, birth defects. You had a cone of protection around you. Thus, when people were poor, when people were sick, when people were born with some crippling disease or some crippling birth defect. It was a sign that they were sinners. You can see how Jesus upset the religious wagon carts. He told them a story about a Samaritan. Well, every good Jew hated Samaritans. They weren't right with God, but this Samaritan in the story, after all, there was a man in a ditch who had been robbed and mugged and was bleeding. All the good, righteous people just passed by. But it was a Samaritan that helped that man. Oh, it's little wonder they wanted him crucified and out of the way. This is blasphemous from their point of view. The 14th chapter of John is delivered on the last day of Jesus' life. Thomas asks a question. Show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus' response is key to understanding. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Now this is John's cryptic way of writing his premise, expounding on his premise. The premise that Jesus was the Word of God walking around in the flesh. So when Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, he is underscoring the fact that the heart of God is standing right here in front of you. The way the truth of God and the life of God is right there. On the last night he expounds in the Gospel of John the next day that full glory 
the full, fuller revelation of, of God's heart would be seen on the cross at Calvary. This is how much I love the world. Being Mother's Day, moms and also dads, good, loving parents know what self-sacrifice is on behalf of children. It's not easy. Sometimes we just want to tell them, you do this or else. And they need to be told that. And especially when they get older and grow into adulthood, we, we yearn to help them in their lives. We've made those sacrifices and we love them even though they are now adult children. But we know we can't force them. At the cross, Jesus says, through his sacrifice, I love the world. I love each one of them. I love beyond race, ethnicity, economic, social status. And that is the truth. That is the truth of Christianity. And then on the third day, he rises from the dead and offers us life eternal, beginning right now. The truth also so of Christianity says that God is in the resurrection business. Not only in the life to come, but right now. The depressing time. The anxious time. The times when we feel hopeless. God can resurrect that and give us the way that leads to life. In Jesus Christ, we see God's perfect love, God's justice walking around in the flesh and the way of following Jesus leads to life not only for us but for all with whom we may come in contact How then shall we live? Be embraced by this love and accept this love. Be led by this love. Asking God, what is the most loving thing and the most loving response I can give in this situation? You know, it's easy to love those who are acceptable to us. But can we love those unacceptable? The Spirit of God living in us can. So, 
I affirm that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I affirm it because that is the heart of God. But I cannot limit people. I cannot limit God regarding other people. Because that heart of God may be living in them. They just don't know the name from which the gift has come. Let us say that I got a great present for Christmas. It's all wrapped up. I open it and it is exactly, I could not have gotten a better present what I wanted. The problem is, I don't know who sent it. Wouldn't I want to know the name of the one who cared enough to send such a great gift? That, my friends, is how we see the world. Jesus still is the way, the truth, and the life, and the concept of expressing fully the heart of God. So let us not judge one another. Let us celebrate the great gift that God has given us. And when we see those who have the gift tell them tell them who sent it that concludes the library reflection for this week may God be with you in this crisis continue to pray Continue to keep safe distance. And if you got those silly looking masks, wear them. But all true Texans wear bandanas. Thank you.